Well, Paula and Sparkle and, and Rima, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, wonderful talks. And I'm really happy to have the chance to sit down and, and dive a little bit deeper in, in your topics, uh, because there is a lot of commonalities also across the talk. So it, it, this will be a, a lot of fun. And I also wanted to say this is a truly international panel. So we have Rima joining us from New Zealand. We have Paula in Spain. And then Sparkle and I are in uh, California and Oregon, so the West Coast of the United States. Uh, so very global panel here. Um, let me just start by asking you a question about how you got to where you are. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Margo, for having me. And it's 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 amazing to be alongside these, these other amazing women. Um, so where I got my start, actually, I'm very non-traditional. I oftentimes when I talk about data science, the folks ask me, how did you transition so many times? I tell them I'm pretty much like a real world neural net. There's no lean, it's not linear at all. Um, in that I started off as a chemical engineer. And at that time, the goal was always to go into oil and gas from chemical engineering or some manufacturing role, which I did. But I knew deep down inside, I wanted to work in the healthcare space. So as an undergrad, I actually seeked out summer internships, instead of going and working for an oil and gas company, I did an internship in one of my professor's lab. And at that time, she was trying to look at ways that you can develop drugs uh, that target solid tumors within the body using the principles of chemical engineering, so fluid mechanics. So how do we evade, for example, the immune system? How do we use the, the principles of Navier-Stokes and flow and understanding how you can concentration gradients can get into the tumor, which is fundamental. And at that time, it was biomedical engineering was near. So I was like, I don't want to just jump into biomedical engineering at the time. So I finished off chemical engineering, went into Procter & Gamble making Old Spice and Gillette deodorants. And I knew that that was not part of what I wanted to do. So I gave myself a two-year window and said, if I fell in love with this, I will actually, if I am passionate about doing a PhD, at two years, I'll make that decision to transition back. And I did um, focus in on biomedical engineering. And again, data science wasn't a thing at that time when I went back from a PhD in 2010. So I actually transitioned and started taking my PhD work and just doing data science projects on the weekend at home. And that was sort of the evolution. And then I had a mentor that pushed me to start putting it out in the public domain via blogs. And I started blogging. And I often tell people that was a way that it helped me sort of put myself out there. And even if, the, if it's not great, if I go back and look at the history of when I started doing the blog into now, it's changed, it's evolved over time. So I see my growth in real time in the public sphere. And literally that's how I got my start in data science. It was not traditional at all. I sort of evolved and continued down the path knowing that I wanted to be in health, but what aspect of it and what questions I wanted to ask answer is what drove me. What about you, Rayma? Yeah, I am non-traditional as well. I still don't quite know if I found my niche. <laughs> but I'm so I love what I do. I love my what I'm doing right now. I started in theory, in economic theory, which is as far as you can get from data science. Um, I just, you know, I loved math, so I love the theory. But after a while, I realized that I was really frustrated by the fact that I wasn't making a difference to the things I cared about, which was uh, society, social sort of challenges. So then I moved into data. I did um, some work in, I, I, I had a fellowship in the US. I met some people from the NHS in the UK. I went to the UK and worked with them on one of their first uh, hospital admission models, which is a very simple model, but that was 2007. So it was pretty early to be deploying these models. And then I came back to New Zealand and I actually deployed one for all the hospitals in Auckland. I think no one's redone that work. So I realized I was pretty good at getting stuff done, which which is always something I really actually liked. And so after that, I started working, I started in health. And then I always say to people, one day I looked at my hospital data and realized the median age of my data set was 70. And suddenly I thought, mm, maybe this is not the I'm much more passionate about children and the healthcare system is more and more serving older and older people. And so then I started working with a really close collaborator now in child protection and child abuse and neglect. And I said to myself, let me, you know, make this into my 
uh, area that I want to make a difference in. And subsequently, I moved into homelessness and mental health. So I very much work on issues that are affecting probably one in 20 of our most vulnerable families in a community and working with how data science can work in the front line. And I just love that work. Uh, so it's, and I'll keep doing it until, you know, they have to wheel me out. <laughs> Thanks. What about you, Paula? Have you always known that you would want to end up where you are now? No, actually, I think also it was like a long and winding road as my fellow panelists. I think it's mainly because when we had the choice, there was no such thing as data science, right? So we, um, we just went through life and finding our way. So I'm a physicist by uh, training, and then I became a biophysicist by my with my PhD, and then I, I discovered life sciences at that time, and probably because I wanted to know how things work. But then I was fascinated about how life works and why are we here, and actually what makes us sick and what makes us healthy was one of the things I was wondering, and I did a lot of simulation, and after a while. When you do simulation, you wonder also whether your models are correct. And that's when I realized and I made the decision I wanted to work with real world data and real world data from patients to understand what makes them sick. And that's, I think, how I came to study a lot of chemistry and biology and medicine. So I think it's um, at, at some point I became a generalist. So that means probably being an expert and not being an expert because then you get a lot of new projects and then you have to actually try to um, find your way through them. So exciting. And I was mainly on, almost on my career in the industry and now I'm a professor in academia. So I think this is something new for me. Well, one thing that you have all mentioned either in your talk or, or just now is that uh, when you started your career, data science and data science algorithm hadn't really penetrated your sectors or the healthcare sectors at much, but now when you look around, it's everywhere. Uh, so there's been very fast adoption of data science techniques and algorithms in, in the healthcare industry. Um, what sur has surprised you the most about this? I May mean, I find the whole thing surprising? The the speed and the acceleration that we're seeing is is mind boggling at times, you know, how fast developments uh, are made and, and how quickly people are to adopt and, and, and use it. But what has surprised you the most? So maybe for me, um, I've discussed in class, when I teach students about AI, we used to talk about narrow AI or limited AI. But in the last two or three years, we started to see, witness this revolution about uh, large language models and GPT and these algorithms that perform many tasks at the same time. And they are they outperform some of our human capabilities as well. And for me, this is surprising how we're moving to this general uh, intelligence and we may get there in the next years, which I thought I would never witness in my life. I think for me, um, even though we are making the advances, the biggest challenge is how far behind we are with getting the data curated, particularly in the US. It's disparate, it's not standardized. And I think a lot of the challenges you will have is how do you harmonize those data sets to generate insights? So from, from, from my lens, we will de develop something that can work, but then the question becomes, can it work outside of what I've developed? And because each data set, each hospital system is quite different. Each platform that collects data sets within a hospital can vary even within that hospital. So how much work has to be done on the preliminary front? So much of it is focused on the algorithms very little of it as a data scientist that's how to go and put a backup is focused on how do, why don't we spend the time to get the right infrastructure in place to get these data sets to a state where we can build tools, not say to solve every single problem or generalize to everything, but to at least get to a point where we could deploy some of these algorithms that are performing well and can make a difference. I think I'll push back on the question. I actually don't think if you look at frontline clinical decision making in your median healthcare system, I'm not talking about your coastal East Coast systems, I'm talking about go to a Midwestern small town clinician, clinical center and ask yourself how much of this 
technology is penetrating into improving outcomes for that patient population, I actually don't think it's not touching the size, in my humble opinion. And I think it's partly because uh, a lot of the technological uh, technological advancements are not being, there's no single kind of industry that is motivated to take those tools and put them into the hands in a way that both patients and clinicians find acceptable. I feel like there's just not the same work that is being done, say, on the pharmaceutical sides. Like we have thousands of pharmaceutical reps around the country who knock on the doors of clinicians and tell them about the latest findings, tell them about the pill, the side effects, and yes, you can adopt it. We don't have that for AI. We don't have anyone who's proselytizing the technology for standard frontline clinicians who did their medical training when they didn't have access to these sorts of tools. So my feeling is I don't think we're going to see any of the impact for front for median patient population until someone solves that problem. Maybe one thing to add as a challenge along these lines is the lack of um, translation that um, the, tr- the lack of translation from the academic setting uh, to the clinic. Actually, a lot of people talk about AI in the hospital, medical AI, but you, at least here in Europe, you get to see very little AI in the hospital side by side uh, with the doctor. And that's, uh, if we ask ourselves why there is no translation, I came to think that one of the reasons is that there's a still a gap about who is going to pay for it. Who is going to pay for the AI in the clinic? So I think the AI is made by humans and there is human everywhere in the AI. So there is human in the collection of data, in the algorithm development, in the interpretation of the data. So basically maybe people, it's not they don't trust the tech itself, but the minds behind the tech. So I think there will be a leap when we can explain uh, the people and educate the citizen on why we're using AI, which are the benefits, and that they see that there is a human in the loop and that there is a human in the loop accompanying the AI in the decision making. There is not just an AI by itself, but there is an AI assisting the doctor. Absolutely agree. I think a lot of um, in my space where clinical randomized clinical trials are the gold standard, it's it's a lot difficult to come in and say, I'm just going to have an AI tool in the case of imaging, right, to uh, to, to grade an image, to which is a key endpoint. You're using that to replace a, using AI to replace a human, which is the gold standard from a clinical trial perspective to grade an image. Um, so the question becomes, like, how do we make sure that the, the clinicians are involved and understand? And that's, that's the piece, exactly what Paul is saying is the education piece, that you're not going to be replaced. It's more of a way to augment and reduce the inter and intra variability that you get from these manual processes and increase productivity. But again, sometimes when you lay it down as productivity increase, it seems like, are you going to you know move my job? No, it gives you an opportunity to focus on other parts of the uh, disease landscape that, that is equally important. Uh, by increasing, you know, reliability on what you're doing, so you could focus on on developing in other areas. Um, so it's just that language around how we involve. And one of the things I try to be mindful of is making sure that those folks are involved in the design process, so their their feedback is involved. Back to what Rima was was mentioning, having started with the end and going backwards, I think has sort of gotten me in a, a little bit more traction with with some of this stuff in in my space, where it's even more like, you know, questioned a lot more. Maybe I think one of the turning points that we will see in the next years is about the chat GPT type of models, the large language models, when we see patients directly and doctors interacting with the technology and asking questions about their health. And very, very, very soon, we will have also the models asking us questions about how we feel. So then there may be a point where we will not know whether we are interacting with a computer or with a telemedicine doctor. So I see that may be a huge challenge also for the trust issue, right? So we as patients, we will have the right to know whether we are interacting with a computer or we are interacting with a real person. 
So I don't know what you guys think, but I think in the in the future, these will be the next conversations that will be on the table. I mean, I don't know that people are as concerned as uh, media make it out to us. I was on a national committee and we had to have conversations across the whole country to understand people's attitudes to data sharing and some of this technology. And we found that it was really a trade-off between what the value for them they saw it as and the the transparency with which you were going to do it. People didn't have as much, at least when we spoke to people in very ordinary settings, you know, in your golf clubs and your, we didn't see the same level of concerns that people seem to portray. I think there's been a kind of, sort of feti I call it a fetishization of AI. It's just an easy thing for people to get the clicks and to get the front page news. And I don't think that that conversation as it's happening in the elite circles reflects correctly the conversations about that technology that's happening in kind of everyday middle New Zealand or middle Australia or middle US. So I don't feel as concerned about the community cons because as I've been working in child abuse and neglect, which is a very challenging area, we basically explained to the community that we've been trying all kinds of things and we haven't moved the dial. And that communities are very open to giving us what we in our group call social license to explore new ways of trying to move the dial because they see the value of moving the dial on something so challenging. So I think that's, that social license piece is is not as concerning as if you were to read newspaper articles. So so good to hear this. You know, they have this this other perspective. Uh, so it's a, it's incredible how fast time flies when when you're talking, uh, and and we're almost done. But I wanted to ask you one last question. I'm curious to see what what you say. Uh, and this is a question I've asked the other panels as well. So if you could steer the world in a particular direction, so you would be the boss, and you could tell people what to do, what would be the first thing you would do in this space? I guess I would say stop stop the narrative that it's going to replace people and start the narrative that is going to complement people in their existing roles because I actually never think that we're going to replace people. People are too cunning. They're never going to be replaced. So now we're going to have to uh, have the conversation that it's going to complement and augment uh, people in their jobs. So for me, I think it would be important that we think more and we promote diversity in the algorithms, in the data sets, in the way we think about AI. Um, I think we should promote, especially in healthcare, that a healthcare is, AI applied to healthcare is um, equitable for everyone. Absolutely. I totally agree with my fellow panelists. I think um, there's a lot of sensationalization of AI and it, it's not going to replace it, it will augment. Uh, you can't replace a physician the, in terms of decision making with an AI algorithm, but you can augment it, uh, their decision making process. And from, from the perspective of teams, you do have to have diverse teams making these type of tools so that you can meet folks where they are. Well, thank you very much again, all of you, for joining us, for taking a little bit of a deeper dive and uh, and uh, lifting the veil a little bit more about what's going on in your minds and in your fields. Uh, and uh, I wish you great success with the, the rest of your career, and it, and I hope you all enjoyed this this panel. Paula, Sparkle, and Rima, thanks.